Now, you know that when you have any kind of container that contains gas, the gas will exert a pressure on that container. Okay, so the pressure on that container is caused by the collision of many gas molecules with the walls of the container. So you're interested in deriving an equation to find out the pressure exerted by the gas. Okay, previously pressure exerted by something that you've learned in AS was either this one, force divided by area, or this one is H rho G. These were equations that related to pressure that you've learned from AS. Now, specifically for this chapter, when you're talking about the pressure exerted by gas, there's another equation that you will learn in addition to the one that you've learned from AS. So you need to learn how to rewrite that equation out. You just first start with a very simple case. Consider that you have a containing vessel, which is a Q of side L, meaning to say that this one is length L, this one is width L, and this one is height L. And then after that, you first consider that you have a gas molecule of mass M that is moving with speed Cx in the horizontal direction only. So you have this one, Cx, moving towards the right with speed Cx. And it will eventually collide with this section of your wall. And after that, it will rebound. So because your collision with the wall is elastic, your molecule will rebound with the same speed, with the same velocity, but in the opposite direction. So this one will be Cx in the opposite direction, giving you something like this. Okay. Now, what you're interested to know then is the momentum change of this gas molecule. The momentum change of this gas molecule it's actually going to be mcx minus negative mcx giving you 2mcx. So here, if let's just say that you're taking the initial momentum minus the final momentum, and you assume that going towards the right is your positive sign convention, it will just be mcx minus with negative mcx. This one would have been considered as positive momentum. This would have been considered as negative momentum for you. Okay. So this is your momentum change. And then after that, your molecule will travel a distance of 2L before colliding again with the same wall. Okay. So right now, what you're trying to do is to find the time elapsed T. You're actually trying to find the time between collisions here, not the time the molecule is in contact with the wall. Okay. If you remember the assumption from the previous page, you always assume that the time of collision is negligible compared to time between collisions. You will use your time between collisions in the derivation of your equation here. Okay, So you want to find the time between collisions right now. So when you're talking about time between collisions, you could understand this. Let me just draw it on the right-hand side here. Sorry, left-hand side here. Your molecule hits with Cx. It hits the wall and then it rebounds with Cx. It goes to this side, it hits this wall again, and then after that, it rebounds again. It hits this wall with Cx and then it rebounds again with Cx and it comes back here and hits the wall again with Cx. So you are trying to find the time between collision as this to this, okay? So what is your distance traveled? Because this one is L, you've gone this side, this one is one L, you go this side, this is another L, so it's two L, okay? So now your time taken is going to be 2L over Cx. Where did this one come from is actually from your speed equals to distance over time equation, such that time is equals to 
distance over speed. Your speed is Cx throughout, isn't it? It's constant speed. So to find the time taken or the time between collision, it will just be 2L over Cx, okay? Okay, so now that you have found momentum change and the time between collision, you now want to find out the force exerted by this single gas molecule on the walls of your container. So the force applied by a molecule on the wall of the container is equals to the rate of change momentum, which you learned in AS physics before this. So you take your momentum change divided by your time between collision, you're going to get mcx squared over L. Okay. And then after that, this one is only for one molecule. You know that when you're talking about gases, there's actually a lot of gas molecules to consider. So you try to make it closer to the real life cases where you consider for n molecules. So when you consider for n molecules now, your force, total force exerted by your gas molecule should just be multiplied with n. If you have n number of molecules moving with speed Cx right now, assuming that they're all moving with same speed Cx towards the right and they're horizontal, the total force exerted should be n m Cx squared over L. Okay, And then after that, you will want to find out the pressure exerted then. After you find the force, you want the pressure. Pressure is defined as force per unit area from your AS. So pressure is F over A. You've already found out your total force. You divide it by your area. Your area here is basically this one. Because you have seen it's a cube, it's going to be L square here. Your width and your height are having the same length. So it's just L squared. So you get M M C X squared divided by L divided by L squared. You're going to get M X C X squared divided by L cube. And then when you're talking about L cube, L cube is actually your volume. So you get N M C X squared divided by volume. Okay. So this is one part here. And now, if you recall what was mentioned to you previously that your gas molecules move randomly. When it's moving randomly, it could mean that they're moving with different magnitudes as well as different directions. So right now, it was already mentioned to you that you now consider n number of gas molecules moving towards the right with speed Cx just now. Now, if you take one step further and make it closer to the real life case, we know that your molecules, if they're moving towards the right, if you have a group of the molecules moving towards the right, they're not going to be moving with the same speed. They'll be moving with different speeds. So what you want to do is to take the average of your speed. So you're going to get nm mean square speed divided by volume, right? Whenever you see something like this with a sharp bracket, let me just write it here. Whenever you see something inside a sharp bracket, this one is actually referring to the mean or average value. So when you see this one, it's actually referring to the mean value of your Cx squared. It's called your mean square speed. Okay. Average of velocity square is called the mean square speed. Okay. Just be careful of how they word it. Because when it comes to this particular term, some people get confused easily. If you compare this one versus this one, they are not the same. Okay, this and this are not the same. This one is called mean square speed. Whereas this one is called mean 
feet square. All right, just be careful about the terms that you use to describe this symbol. In your ideal guess chapter, you're always using this. Okay, it's called mean square speed. You won't be using this. This is called mean speed square. Okay, all right. So now your equation at this point is P equals to nmcx square divided by V. This one here is for N molecules moving horizontally only with different speeds. So we already taken into account this part here where you're talking about them moving at different magnitudes. But we haven't talked, we haven't tackled the part where they're supposed to be moving in different directions. How do we take into account that your molecules are supposed to move in different directions also into this derivation? So we know that when you're talking about your molecules, they don't move only in one direction, but they move in three different directions, namely in the x, y, and z axis directions. So in the x, y, z and axis direction, it could mean something like this. You could have x here, you could have y here, and you could have z here. Okay. So your gas molecules, when they move, they could be moving in any of these three directions, the x, y, and z directions. Okay, such that because they move in the three different directions here, you could say that the c square is equals to cx square plus cy square plus cx square. Okay, there's actually an explanation for this, but it's really not really necessary for your A2 syllabus. Just know that because your gas molecules tend to move in three different directions, you can say that c mean square speed is the same as mean square speed in the x direction plus mean square speed in the y direction plus mean square speed in the z direction. You can think of this one as something like the resultant mean square speed. Okay. So your resultant mean square speed is you adding the x, y, and z together. Okay. And then you also have another separate fact to remember. Because your molecules are moving randomly, your mean square speed in the x direction is equal to mean square speed in the y direction is equal to mean square speed in the z directions. The reason for this is that when molecules move in random, equal proportions of molecules move in x, y, and z direction h. Okay, so when your molecules are moving in random, they assume that equal proportions of the molecules are moving in x, y, and z directions h. Meaning to say, you say, for example, you have 3,000 molecules, 1,000 molecules will be in the x direction. Another 1,000 molecules will be in the y direction. And then the remaining 1,000 molecules will be in the z direction. That's the reason why you can say that mean square speed in the x direction is equal to that in the y, is equal to that in the z. Okay, so this is another fact. Right, these two, there's actually some sort of long-winded explanation for it, but it's not really covering your A2 syllabus. Okay, just remember this fact. Okay, so once you can remember this two fact, then your equation can be simplified to something like this. Mean square speed is equals to mean square speed in the x direction plus mean square speed in the x direction plus mean square speed in the x direction, giving you three times of your mean square speed in the x direction. Because your original equation was this, you see. This was your original equation. Mean square speed is equal to mean square speed in the x plus y plus z. But because mean square speed in the x direction is equal to that in the y, is equal to that in the z, you can actually replace this all as mean square speed in the x direction. That's what you're getting right over here. So your mean square speed is three times the mean square speed in the x direction. 
Therefore, mean square speed in the x direction is a third of your resultant mean square speed, which you will now substitute into here. Okay, so you substitute into there, you get p equals to nm over v, 1 over 3 mean square speed, like this, such that you get pv equals to 1 over 3 nm mean square speed. That is your final equation that you can see at the bottom here. Okay, so this equation here, pv equals to 1 over 3 nmc square, is the equation that you need to remember, and you also need to know a bit about its derivation. This equation here is what tells you the pressure exerted by gas inside a container. Okay. Okay, so from the PV equals to 1 over 3 nmc square, there's another form to that equation that you can actually derive. You see, if you look at your equation, this one here, PV equals to 1 over 3 nmc square, you can actually change this into this form where it's p equals to 1 over 3 density mean square speed. Okay, now, before you go to that, if you're talking about your n here, this n here that you're looking at from your equation is actually number of molecules. And then what about this m here? m here, a lot of times people assume that it's the mass of your gas. This is actually wrong. It's actually the mass of one molecule. Okay, this is the mistake that a lot of people always do. It's not the mass of the gas. This is the mass of one molecule only. Because you see how it was derived, the M that you have here was actually the M that you have all the way at the top right over here. It's actually referring to the mass of one gas molecule only. Okay, it's not referring to the mass of the gas itself. Okay, so from there, if I wanted to find out the mass of the gas, what can I do? If you wanted to find out the mass of the gas, you take N multiply with M. Nm is the mass of your gas. All right. Then if you're talking about density, density is mass over volume, isn't it? If density is mass over volume, this mass is mass of gas. This volume is volume occupied by gas or volume of containing vessel. Okay, so right now density here by right should be nm over v giving you rho. Okay, that's how you get the density of your gas right now. You take the mass of your gas divided by the volume occupied by your gas or volume of your containing vessel that will give you your density. So if you look at PV equals to nmc square right over here, if I had just written it like this, where I say that P is equals to 1 over 3 nm divided by V multiplied with mean square speed, this one, this expression here that you see is actually equals to my density. So therefore, P is 1 over 3 rho C square. This is another equation that you should know how to derive. You will see some questions later on that ask you to derive this equation. Just know that this equation is actually derived from the first equation above here. Okay, and this equation itself, you also need to know how to derive. So you get the impression right now that ideal gas actually has a lot of derivation, which is kind of true. Okay, 
So these two equations that I've just put in the level box here, just remember their equation and how to derive it. At some point, you will need to derive them in your questions. So hopefully this is okay. Okay, now for the last page, let's just recap some of the equations that you've learned so far. You have PP equals to NRT. You have PP equals to NKT. You have PV equals to 1 over 3 NMC square, which can sometimes be written as P equals to 1 over 3 rho C square. There's another equation from this part that you also need to derive from. Okay, from this equation itself, you also need to derive another separate equation. That equation actually relates your average kinetic energy of molecules. Okay, it's related to your average kinetic energy of your molecules. Okay, so it can be shown that the average kinetic energy EK of gas molecules is directly proportional to its absolute temperature. How you do that is by equating PV equals to 1 over 3 nmc square with PV equals to nkt. You will have to make use of these two equations in order to derive some sort of new equation where it's supposed to be half mc square equals to 3 over 2 kt. Okay, so this second and third equation is what got you the fourth equation. If you equate them together, let me just show you the derivation. PV equals to 1 over 3 nmc square and PV equals to nkt. If you equate them, you're going to get 1 over 3 nmc square equals to nkt. The n will cancel off. Eventually, you will get mc square equals to 3kt. Now, if you want to relate kinetic energy, kinetic energy you know is half mv square in general. Notice that this one is actually already mc square. It's already similar in form to mv square here. So what you just need to do is to multiply with half for both sides right now. So if you multiply with half of both sides, what you will end up with is half mc square equals to 3 over 2 kt. Okay. So from there, since mean kinetic energy of gas molecule is equals to half mc square, therefore ek equals to 3 over 2 kt. Okay, so this is the equation that you need to remember. Okay, it's half mc square equals to 3 over 2 kt or mean kinetic energy equals to 3 over 2 kt. Now it's from this relation here that you can actually say something like this. Because you can see that this 3 over 2k is constant, you see. Your k here is your Boltzmann constant from the first page. You can actually say that k is constant. Therefore, mean kinetic energy is proportional to temperature. Okay? So that's how you can say that average kinetic energy of molecules is proportional to absolute temperature. Okay? All right, now, another thing to note here also for your equation is this. Your EK or half mc square is the average kinetic energy of a single molecule only. Its value is that for a molecule, not for the whole number of molecules. What do I mean by that? It will probably be easier to think of it like this. Let's just say that I give you an example where I have five different persons, each of different mass. This guy maybe is 60 kg, this guy is 72 kg, this guy is 85 kg, this guy is maybe underweight 55, and then this one is obese, 103 kg. So I have three different persons with different masses right now. 
if I were to ask you about the average mass of this five person, you will automatically tell me it's going to be 60 plus 72 plus 85 plus 55 plus 103 divided by 5, giving me some value. You're going to get an average mass of 75 kg. Okay, this is your average mass of the persons. Okay, so right now, when I talk about this 75 kg here, you can easily understand that it's not really referring to the total mass of everyone here. It's really referring to the average mass of a person inside that group. So right now, that same concept also kind of applies to this. When you're talking about the half mc square or ek that you're seeing in these equations that you have right over here, that kinetic energy you're talking about is the average kinetic energy of a single molecule in that group of molecules. Okay, it's really referring to a single molecule value only. Okay, so if you have wanted to find out the total kinetic energy of all your molecules, okay, total, what you just need to do is that you take your, your number of molecules, multiply with your mean kinetic energy of a single molecule. Much in the same way here, if I'm talking about this group of people again, if I wanted to find out their total mass, I would take the number of people that I have multiplied with my average mass to get back my total mass. So it's a similar concept here again. To find my total Ka, I take the number of molecules multiplied with the average Ka of a single molecule. All right. So now my Ka total can also be rewritten as 3 over 2 NKT because EK here was equals to 3 over 2 KT. Okay, so you multiply with N now, it's going to be 3 over 2 NKT with the addition of N here. So that one is actually referring to your total KE. Okay. So you can see right now that these two are actually kind of similar, just that one of them has an N inside. When you have an N inside, it's actually referring to the total Ke of all the molecules. Okay, so that one hopefully is clear. Okay, then after that, you need to relate to your internal energy now. Okay, yeah. So right now, if you remember what I mentioned to you about ideal gases, I do guess there's no molecular PE because there's no intermolecular force. If you refer back to the definition of internal energy where it's the sum of Ke plus PE, I do guess has no intermolecular force. Therefore, PE is zero. So internal energy of ideal gas is just the Ke. In your case, the Ke is the total Ke of all the gas molecules. Okay, so right now, it will be correct to say that IE is actually 3 over 2 and Kt2. Okay, at the top here, you already found out that total Ke is 3 over 2 and Kt. But when you apply it to an ideal gas, Internal energy of ideal gas is just the Ke. So it's going to just going to be 3 over 2 NKT. Okay, so this is one thing again to note. You will see this in your question later. All right. And last thing also to mention is that mean square speed is not the same as mean speed square. This one I just explained the differences to you. So this one uh you probably don't need to explain again. And when you're talking about your mean square speed, this one you will eventually be required to find a particular quantity called root mean square speed, the IMS speed. IMS speed is just the root square of the mean square speed. Okay, so that is from that part. So far, all the equations that you've learned is actually summarized in this table. You've learned that you have equation P equals to 1 over 3 nmc square. You have 
half mc square goes to 3 over 2 kt. These are usually specifically used for questions that are asking for root mean square speed or mean square speed itself. Okay. And then other than you learn that you also have PB equals to NKT. This one is usually for questions that involve finding the number of molecules. See this N here is the big N. It's actually talking about number of molecules. All right. And then after that, your original equation is PB equals to NRT. This one, you should remember it by now. This is something that you've learned very early on. This one you usually use when you're trying to find number of moles. Because this small n here refers to number of moles. Okay. Then after that, the last one that is least common, you won't use this as much, is P1 over V1 equals to P2 over T2. Okay. Usually you only use this for some other cases that don't fit any of this. And it's only when your number of moles of gas is the same on both sides. Okay. So this one is the gist of ideal gases with all the related equations and derivation. So let's just do some questions. 